This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. All of our podcasts are available from our website, www.sas.ac.uk. Well, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation to Claudia Wiedepool and Peter Mack. And thanks for the kind introduction to Christopher Johnson. I'm very happy to be here. Um, where I started working on my book almost 10 years ago now. <laughs> and um, I chose to speak on fashion, also on fashion, because um, I didn't want to repeat myself, but now I'm going to repeat a lot of uh, what Philip Eckhart said, but maybe that's not such a bad thing, because overall fashion is about repetition, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, rien ne meurt, tout se transforme, nothing dies, Everything is transformed. This quote from Balzac is one of the two sentences Walter Benjamin has put as a motto in front of the convolute B in which he collects his notes concerning fashion. His comment on this sentence follows a few pages later. Fashion, that is Benjamin's paraphrase, mocks death and with it any notion of disruption and discontinuity. The restless change of fashions suggests the time consists of a never-ending chain of innovations. But what seems to be a constant progress is in fact only the repetition of the same. The seemingly new and fresh forms take up older forms that keep recurring in different settings and new combinations. We've seen that. Nothing dies, everything is transformed. This means in the realm of fashion, nothing new is truly new. With its fiction of steady innovation, fashion is a very vivid example um, of the ideology of progress Benjamin sets out to criticize in his arcades project. Yet what may strike one as enigmatic are the two questions Benjamin poses to close his remarks. He asks, and I quote, were there fashions in antiquity or did the authority of the frame preclude them? Unfortunately, Benjamin has not answered these questions, but maybe the very question points to the course he would have taken in discussing fashion. If fashion is a paradigm of modernity, it is bound to be also an exclusively modern phenomenon. And if there didn't exist fashions in antiquity, antiquity might provide a concept of time that eludes the empty time of progress. So what I would like to do in my talk is not to answer the questions, uh, but to clarify its implications. And I will do so by a detour via Fischer, Simmel and Warburg. As the notion of antiquity as a timeless time, untouched by any fashionable changes, is in fact quite common in fashion theories around 1900. Friedrich Theodor Fischer and Georg Simmel, whose texts Benjamin has extensively extracted in the Convolute B, see a strong affinity between fashion and modernity and set modernism apart from a classical or antique ideal that seems to have been immune to the folly of a fashion. On the other hand, Warburg's work on antique and modern imagery is also based on observations on the changing forms of fashion. We've heard that from Philip Eckhart and I'm going to elaborate on it a bit more. Abi Warburg studies on the way in which antiquity is being remembered in Renaissance art is closely linked to his concept of the pathos formal. The word pathos formal brings to mind distinct shapes and outlines of moving bodies as depicted in antique art that are transported through the ages. Yet the initial cue to Warburg's observations on the influence of antiquity is not given by representations of bodies, but by the dresses they are draped with. Warburg's dissertation on Botticelli, published in 1893, does not concentrate on postures and poses but on the accessory forms in motion, das bewegte Beiwerk. These accessory forms might be marginal at first sight, but they move into the center of Warburg's attention. His analytical gaze on Botticelli's birth of Venus shifts from the naked Venus placed in the center of the composition to the figure moving into the picture from the right-hand side. It is the goddess of spring coming to dress Venus who has just emerged from the sea still floating on her shell. This woman, pressing in from the right-hand side, captures Warburg's interest not because of her gestures or mimics, but because of her dress and hair. And I quote from Warburg. Her gown, embroidered all over with cornflowers, clings to her body. 
A fold curves gently downward to the right from the back of her left knee, fanning out in smaller folds below. Her narrow sleeves, puffed at the shoulders, are worn over a white undergarment of soft material. Most of her hair wafts back from her temples in long waves, but some has been made into a stiff braid that ends in a bunch of loose hair." End of quote. Barbock's basic assumption that the Renaissance draws on antique forms in order to represent movement is obviously gained by observations on dress and coiffure. But what is so stunning about the ways in which Botticelli dresses his female figures? There are two articles of dress that especially arrest Warburg's attention. The first is a white, almost transparent garment that reaches down to the knees or feet and is held up by an invisible belt. The second one is a gown which is loosely thrown over the shoulder and blown by the winds in highly dynamic, sometimes even circular waves. This light undergarment can also be found in Botticelli's painting Spring, also the figure on the right hand side, almost diaphanous. Um, both the white garment and the gown worn over it are alien to the contemporary Florentine dress code, but they can easily be traced to antiquity. Botticelli's women can apparently pride themselves on wearing an ideal costume copied from antique dress patterns. Yet a more closer look, which Warburg of course takes, reveals the fact that the supposedly authentic antique garment is the effect of a misinterpretation. The recurring piece of cloth that billows out from the woman's shoulder and is left without evident means of support seems oddly dysfunctional. It's, yeah, you can see it very well on this drawing by Botticelli. It's, it's a circle above the shoulder. What Botticelli um, interprets as a loose veil is due to the misreading of an antique dressing item, the himation, that was loosely tied around the body and worn as a gown over the white chiton. You can see the chiton on the, on the left side, that's the undergarment, and then the himation that is slung loosely um, over the shoulder. The metamorphosis from the antique Imation to an unconnected piece of drapery makes it quite clear that Warburg's Florentine nymphs try, but not quite succeed, in exhibiting ancient dresses. In Warburg's work, the history of fashion turns into an index for the history of artistic styles. In Florentine as well as in Flemish artworks around 1400, Warburg sees female figures who are mostly wearing what he calls the contemporary costume. This contemporary costume still conforms with the confining and restrictive dressing habits of the Middle Ages. Yet other figures already wear the ideal costume, the garments always slightly in motion that Warburg has traced back to antiquity. The choice of an ideal or a contemporary costume is intimately connected to the state of artistic innovation Warburg credits them with. Modeling address a l'antica apparently ranges far higher on the scale of artistic value than wearing the rich and stately garments of Burgundy's ladies. In Warburg's evalu evalu evaluation of these traditional costumes reverberates the discourse on fashion already well established around 1900. One of the traces that is indicated by Warburg's theory, theory of ornamental forms <coughs> as a psychodynamic sign leads to Friedrich Theodor Fischer. It is well known that Fischer's category of empathy forms the theoretical backdrop of Warburg's dissertation on Botticelli, as well as the theoretical fragments that Warburg is working on at the time. Yet Friedrich Theodor Fischer has not only gained prominence as a philosopher of aesthetics, but also stepped forward with two critical essays on fashion. In 1859, he publishes an essay titled Vernünftige Gedanken über die jetzt Mode, Reasonable Thoughts on Current Fashion. And in 1878, he takes up his central arguments in an essay Wieder einmal über Mode, on fashion again. In both texts, Fischer articulates his hope that women would finally abandon hooped skirts and crinolines and get themselves what Fischer calls a reasonable dress. Fashion, for Fischer, is neither contingent nor does it follow its own logic. Fashion is rather a sign of the times. In one of his examples, Fischer hints at the notion of a political unconscious that Benjamin was of course very interested in. In a passage that Benjamin included in his convolute B, 
Fisher looks back on his first essay on fashion. And I quote from Benjamin, quoting Fisher, We took the crinoline to be the symbol of the Second Empire in France, of its overblown lies, its hollow and purse-proud impudence. End of quote. What Fischer relentlessly decries as the folly of fashion, Wahnsinn der Mode, has a hidden system. The whims of fashion follow an invisible master, and this master is the character of the times that presses everybody to display his own disposition and habit. Fashion, it seems, is a cultural symptom, an unconscious but inevitable expression of an era. It is very easy for Fischer to decode what is currently en vogue in the year 1878, being surrounded by low-cut dresses that are tightly stretched over the belly. It is nothing but Hurenmode, dresses fashioned for prostitutes. The perfect lack of style, die vollendete Stillosigkeit, is the fruit of female competition, who are furiously fighting for male attention. The most general key to fashion, as Fischer sees it, is not only political attitude, but sexual attraction. Fischer now opposes the oversexed and tasteless fashion of his own days with something he calls style in the most emphatic sense. In describing this style, he mobilizes familiar traits of classicist aesthetics. Style is clear, firm, complete and resolute. Klar, fest, ganz und bestimmt. Dresses tailored in true style will always fit and will suit everybody because they are perfectly adjusted to natural forms. This does not mean that true style imitates nature, for example by attaching artificial flowers to collars or birds' nests to hats. Dresses should rather respect the physical shape of the wearer by discreetly following its outlines instead of exaggerating, puffing up or overemphasizing certain parts of the body. Fashion and style also establish different relations between, between the individual and the general public. True style can only be found when nobody tries to set him or herself off and put him or herself forward. The best example for true style Fischer can think of is the military uniform, being the model of firmness and resolution. Last but not least, between fashion and style there is also a tangible difference in quality. Because fashion needs constant change and innovation, and because one vogue supersedes the previous one in even greater speed, fashion leads to the permanent devaluation of what has been. The opposing velocity of these vogues preclude the use of precious and persistent materials, be it and durable fabrics or noble metals and stones. True style, on the other hand, will only use materials of the highest quality. This points to a difference in the organization of time concepts. Whereas fashion is flimsy and transitory, style is persistent and lasting. Fashion forces time to fly, style tries to make it stand still. Fischer's dream of what he calls style is peculiar not only in its disconcerting ideal of military uniform, making men fit for war, but also in its use of antiquity as the residue of true style. In fact, the Chiton and Timation are for Fischer the benchmark of good taste. Especially in women's fashion, Fischer can't think of anything more fitting than antique garments. In ancient Greece and Rome, hair and dress were allowed to fall and float freely in an unsoph unsophisticated and, as Fischer puts it, in a naive way. By characterizing by characterizing these seemingly natural, free and beautiful dressing habits as naive, Fischer evokes an aesthetic term that figures prominently in German classicism. Schiller opposes ancient naivete with modern sentimentalism, longing for a lost simplicity, innocence and unity of mind that can never be reattained. Drawing on this concept, Fischer interprets fashion as the signature of an alienated modernity that has to be overcome in a joint effort of reasonable women. Fischer's critique of fashion ends with a utopian outlook on an almost revolutionary attack on fashion. All it would take are groups of women conspiring in every city and presenting themselves in reasonable clothes on an appointed day. <laughs> These clothes would have to be designed by artists of true taste, receiving their ideas who could have any doubt from antiquity. 
only the comeback of ancient forms can transcend his contemporaries' whore-like fashion. Georg Simmel's thoughts on fashion, although certainly more reflected and complex, resembles Fischer's polemical view in one point. Even Simmel's theory confronts fashion with its counterpart, a fashionless classic. His essay on fashion, published in 1905, analyzes the simultaneous and conflicting needs for social assimilation and for social distinction as the fundamental paradox of fashion. And following the change of fashion vogues, one tries to connect with others and wants to stand out at the same time. It is this paradox that accelerates the change of fashion. The female fixation on fashion that Fischer emphasizes so strongly is also addressed by Simmel. Yet Simmel interprets it as a compensation for the fact that women have been forced to live far more restricted lives than men do. Being tied to acceptable and fitting behavior, women try to break free from social conventions, at least with their dresses. Especially in the 14th and 15th century, the exact era in which Warburg traces changes in dress, and Fischer dates the origin of the folly of fashion, Simmel sees evidence for a newly developing concept of individuality which excludes women. The immoderate interest in hypertrophic dresses, especially in Northern Europe, is a consequence. In Italy, Simmel argues, women were given almost equal access to education and culture and apparently didn't feel the need to dress with excessive extravaganza. Similar to Fischer, Simmel opposes the inconstant and inexpedient forms of fashion with an opposite, a quality he terms classic. Classical forms, and I'm going to cut this, cut this short, are concentrated, composed and symmetrically organized. They have a classic repose, the klassische Ruhe in the German original, of ancient Greek sculptures. The German formula, klassische Ruhe, obviously borrowed from Winkelmann, implies a calmness so profound that it seems not to be touched by time. The classic is therefore detracted from change or fashionable transformations. Simmel opposes it to what he calls Baroque, and I'm very thankful <laughs> for the remarks Christopher Johnson made yesterday, epitomizing not only anything that is extreme and excessive. The term Baroque also indicates the contingent and restless movement shaping itself into a social lifestyle in modern fashion, eine soziale Lebensform, as Simmel calls it. Warburg's texts can be read as an interesting contribution to this critical discourse on fashion, which draws so heavily on the fairly under-theorized bias of a classical naive. In 1905, the same year in which Simmel's essay on fashion appears, Warburg publishes his study on artistic exchanges between North and South in the 15th century. In this essay, Warburg shifts from the diachronic perspective on the emergence of an ideal style to a synchronic investigation into the trade of images between Italy and Northern Europe around 1450. The starting point for his analysis is the unbalanced coexistence of different stylistic and iconographic traditions, producing rather strange hybrids. Scenes of popular merrymaking are acted out by ladies dressed in gallant and stately garments copied from Burgundy's court. But some of these dresses are already starting to be set in motion following the antique example. It is this mixture of styles and not the pure return to antiquity which leads to the artistic innovation in the Renaissance. Warburg develops this basic assumption in discussing a Florentine engraving titled The Battle for the Breaches, attributed to Baccio Baldini. Maybe it is this sujet, women competing for a male garment, <coughs> that suggested the metaphorical subtext and its allusions to fashion. <coughs> Excuse me. Warburg's alignment of images provides the perfect illustration to Fischer's polemical proposition that the folly of fashion is connected to the female überbieten im Manfang, the sexual competition. Baccio Baldini shows a group of women fighting for a man's breaches and therefore an allusion to a biblical text supports this conjecture, fighting for the man himself. 
By presenting a Norwegian Tina, a small painted portable box he incidentally came across on a holiday in Scandinavia, Warburg can prove the northern origin of this motif. What interests, us, what interests Warburg is the way in which the Italian version presents its figures and dresses that have taken a turn a l'antica. Apart from documenting a critical phase in the stylistic development of the early Renaissance, the pictures Warburg presents mark a milestone in the history of fashion. As Fischer has pointed out in his short history of fashion, the begin of the Narrentanz of fashion can be dated back to the 14th century. It is a very specific article of dress, a female headgear, Fischer seems especially focused on, that returns as a missing link in Warburg's argument, and Philip Eckert already mentioned it. In Fischer's concept of fashion, hats and hat pieces are extensions of the individual and his natural personality. Fischer elaborates on this by discussing the so-called Anan, a very high and very pointed hat worn only by women of high standing. For Fischer, the Anan is the very symptom of fashion that follows the urge to heighten the physical appearance and thus to rise in social estimation against all laws of nature. Warburg, obviously well versed in the history of fashion, immediately notices this headgear, or rather, the very lack of it, in Baldini's The Battle of the Breaches. Instead of wearing the contemporary Anan, some of the ladies in Baldini's version are sporting fantastic headpieces, the pseudo-antique Medusa wings, and some of them wear their hair falling loosely over their shoulders. Might, that's a bit too small to see, probably. Warburg stresses this bizarre juxtaposition not only because the Anan belongs to the dressing standards Baldini normally observes in his pictures. The Anan also turns into a fossil, this is Warburg's expression, leading back to the Flemish pictorial tradition. Warburg attributes Baldini's rather inchoate attempt in addressing the women in ideal instead of in contemporary costumes not to a contingent shift of fashions, but to a true revolution in artistic styles. It is the rebellion of a natural feeling of forms, a natürliches Formgefühl, that leads to the dismissal of the cos costume a la francese. The realistic depiction of a contemporary unnatural fashion is superseded by a new ideal that tries to follow the natural forms of physical movement and does so by looking back to antiquity. Discussing another Florentine engraving, the punishment of Cupid, Warburg pities the poor ladies dressed in long and heavy garments a la francese with their long sleeves that hardly allow them to raise their arms. This French fashion is not only unclassical, Warburg again calls it Baroque, it is also too rhetorical to be understood. The dresses are an obstacle for the dramatic simplicity of gesture, the lingua franca of body language every human can understand. The return to classical costume is the way to a clearer and more distinct artistic expression. The gist of this argument seems to be nothing but an echo of Fischer's complaint about contemporary fashion. Warburg's description of the ideal costume seems to be along the lines Fischer sets out in 1878 in his thoughts on reasonable dresses, a program some women have in fact started to implement around 1900. Gombrich has already pointed out the connection between Warburg's interest in loose dresses and the so-called so reform order, that McEwen has mentioned, a chain of fashion closely tied to the image of the new woman and to early forms of women's liberation movement. This highly politicized reform mode announced itself around the turn of the century by replacing the constricting corset worn in the 19th century. It is in fact very telling that Warburg describes the new dresses emphatically as the tokens of a liberation that has been overdue. It is the liber liberation from gallant dress coats and its heavy materials, the emancipation from courtly pomp that turns the depicted figures into liberated, not free, creatures of pictorial fantasy. In Warburg's version, the rebirth of antiquity is the welcome act of emancipation from the rule of contemporary fashion. And yet, the question remains whether Warburg really interprets the return to antique forms as a step towards something that is not 
fashion, something that isn't subject to vogues, something that is timeless and unchangeable. Warburg's work on the theatrical costumes for the Intermedi of 1589, published two years after his dissertation on Botticelli, suggests otherwise. Inspired by Burkhardt's thoughts on Florentine festive pageantry, Warburg analyzes the festivities staged in 1589 to welcome Christina of Lorraine as the bride to Grand Duke Ferdinand I. One of its highlights were the so-called Intermedi, richly decorated and diligently arranged musical dramas. On their path to the opera, that should affect the audience by the power of its music, the Intermedi seem to be stuck halfway in a spectacle of allegorical costumes. Amidst their stifling dresses, Warburg again discovers a certain type he has discussed before. It is the Florentine nymph with her flitting gown and flowing hair that seems to be imported from ancient representations. Yet, her appearance has little to do with the emphatically welcomed classical style that Fischer or Simmel evoke. Although her dresses are blowing and billowing, according to the antique pictorial tradition, she is definitely wearing too many of them. Besides her flimsy garment, she's draped in numerous jackets, gowns and veils, which makes her costume all but plain and simple. On the contrary, her dress seems so affected and indecent that for the preacher Savonarola, the antique veil or velo becomes the very symbol of decadence and worldly corruption. It is important to note that Warburg himself abstains from explaining the nymph's costume as a lapse from an antique ideal marking the point where the Renaissance gives way to manierism. Warburg in fact insists on interpreting it as the logical consequence of the Renaissance wish to uncover antique forms. Even in, in its exaggerated forms, the pictorial modes of movement express the newly awakened sense for an antique grace. Apparently, the influence of antiquity can be traced in many shapes and forms. So, does Warburg really share the critical impetus against fashion that figures so prominently in Fischer's and more moderately in Simmel's theory of fashion? Firstly, the return to antiquity does not lead to the classic repose Simmel opposes to the ever-moving vogues of fashion. In Warburg's view, the antique garments allow the body to exhibit its extremely vivid gestures. The antique dress provokes extreme motions and emotions. And secondly, the antique dress is not beyond fashion. It is itself nothing but fashion, be it termed all antiqua or quasi alla greca. The antique dress features not as a timeless classic, but leads to citations that expose and even highlight the historical difference. What used to be a basic and pragmatical piece of clothing survives only as a dysfunctional and random accessory. What Fischer fails to see in his diatribe against fashion becomes evident in Warburg's close look on the historical material. Antiquity is no simple ideal transcending the flight of time. It is not the exception to the rule of fashion, but is itself subject to its laws. There seems to be no way out of fashion. This implicit insight resurfaces when Warburg prepares his talk on the snake ritual, which he presented in Kreuzlingen. Not only is the return of antiquity, as Warburg has jotted down in his work on festive culture, a question of tailoring, a Schneiderfrage. The tragedy of costume is also the history of human tragedy. Die Tragik der Tracht ist im weitesten Sinne die Geschichte der menschlichen Tragödie, Warburg writes. Dressing oneself is on the one hand a very basic form of cultural self-augmentation and therefore a step from the mythical dependence on nature to what Warburg calls enlightenment. On the other hand, and this is the tragedy of culture that Warburg unfolds in his talk, the very achievements of human culture can trigger mythical fears. Warburg relies here on the notion of primitive man who, by law of empathy, tends to animate the shapes he has himself created. The ornamental forms mimicking the movements of the snake can be seen as an effort to control natural forces and to banish their threat, at least symbolically. Yet these very forms are bound to provoke new fantastical fears. This applies also to the fashionable forms alla greca. 
the accessory forms in motion, and this is something Warburg points out in his dissertation on Botticelli, stimulates fantastic images. Alberti, and I quote Warburg, gives rein to his fancy, attributing life to inanimate accessory forms. At such moments he sees snakes tangling, flames licking. End of quote. Fischer's folly of fashion returns in Warburg's writings not as erotomania, but as an irrational approach to the outward world that seems to gain on humans exactly and tragically at those points where he tried to disentangle himself from his mythical state of perception. The ornaments derived from antique art can always turn into tangled snakes. Warburg's notion of a tragic entanglement in human history gives the cue and maybe also a key to Benjamin's question that served as the starting point for my talk. Benjamin's unanswered question concerning the fashions of antiquity has its hidden background in Benjamin's conception of tragedy. With his two questions, were there fashions in antiquity or did the authority of the frame preclude them? Benjamin quotes an argument he makes in his book on German Baroque morning play, the Trauerspielbuch. What Benjamin calls the authority of the frame concerns the death of the tragic hero, which is the telos of the tragic plot. It is important to note that Benjamin argues against the notion of his contemporaries like Volkert or Scheler who treat the tragic as a timeless universal, a cosmic reality, as Scheler would have put it. For Benjamin, tragedy as a form of art is linked to a very distinct state of human consciousness. Tragedy designates the point where humans attempt to escape from what Benjamin calls the age of demonic ambiguity, this dämonische Zeitalter der Zweideutigkeit. In Greek tragedy, this applies to the world of the pagan gods and their unlimited power that can neither be controlled nor understood along moral or rational terms. And the tragic Agon, the hero is fighting for his life that is to be sacrificed and thereby meeting his gods with silent resistance. This resistance, which is still inarticulate, marks the transition from the state of the demonic to a new state of moral decision. The death of the tragic hero observes the rules of ritual sacrifice and yet uses this ritual only in order to transform it. His death has ceased to be a sacrifice offered to the gods and has turned into a self-sacrifice designed to accuse and incriminate their laws. What is important in Benjamin's reading of Greek tragedy is the dialectical movement or rather the dialectical moment he emphasizes. The impending death of the hero is exactly the moment where the old and the new, the state of demonic ambiguity and the state of moral decision, converge and one emerges out of the other. Death is a crisis, an incision into the mythical time that initiates transition. It is this notion of simultaneous coexistence and dialectical transition marked by a sudden and violent moment that becomes a basic concept in Benjamin's Arcade, Arcades project. In his approach to the history of modernism, Benjamin is interested in early forms that try to adapt to new circumstances and do so by quoting ancient forms. For example, Benjamin discerns in a female cyclist dressed in an odd Renaissance-like attire the preformation of contemporary sportswear. Benjamin interprets this costume as an expression of the inability to find appropriate forms for the newly emerging technical worlds and social lifestyles. As Benjamin notes in the Convolute and Fashion, and I quote, each time what sets the tone is without doubt the newest, but only where it emerges in the medium of the oldest, the longest past, the most ingrained, end of quote. Yet, at the same time, Benjamin credits fashion with the ability to anticipate the future. Fashion has, he says, an incomparable nose for what lies waiting in the future. Fashionable forms not only quote things past, but are also charged with possibilities. As they are driven by the unconscious wish to break free from an imperfect and disappointing present, they provide snapshots that are literally pregnant with things to come. 
As the collective dream energy being at work in them is quite uninhibited, the changing forms of fashion present an excellent object for Benjamin's history of modernity. By ceaselessly pushing new products onto the market, fashion becomes the source of what Benjamin calls dialectical images. The dialectical image is a notoriously ambiguous concept. On the one hand, it refers to the symptoms and wish images Benjamin sets out to criticize. On the other hand, it means the shape in which this critique is taking place. The dialectical image is a form in which an era dreams its new and better future by quoting anything ancient, be it the primal past or antiquity. And the dialectical image is also the form in which the critical historian can read these hidden wishes and redeem the past from its spell. In his thesis on the philosophy of history, Benjamin illuminates this enigmatic concept by another side glance on fashion and its passion for evoking the past. And I quote, the French Revolution viewed itself as Rome incarnate. It evoked ancient Rome the way fashion evokes costumes of the past. Fashion has a flair for the topical, no matter where it stirs in the thickets of long ago. It is a tiger's leap into the past. This jump, however, takes place in an arena where the ruling class gives the commands. The same leap in the open air of history is the dialectical one, which is how Marx understood the revolution." End of quote. <coughs> this twofold tiger leap into the past, once done in the arena where the ruling class gives the commands and once done in the open air of history, has some resemblance to the death of the tragic hero in the Trauerspielbuch, which is also twofold. It is on the one hand sacrifice for the gods and on the other hand um, evidence against them. It is important to note that Benjamin's cultural history of the Arcades project shares important concepts with his early studies on literature. So Benjamin interprets the realm of consumer culture, in which fashion plays such an important role, as a state of demonic ambiguity. Just like the ancient Greeks were trapped in their mythical beliefs in the Olympic gods, 19th century is trapped in its belief in capitalism that has become something like a mythical force. And just as the ancient gods demand the recurring religious acts, fashion orchestrates certain rituals. I quote from Benjamin's Exposé of 1935, fashion prescribes the ritual according to which the commodity fetish demands to be worshipped. Benjamin not only takes up his notion of demonic ambiguity and of archaic rituals when talking about 19th century culture, he also outlines the dialectical image in surprising accordance to Greek tragedy. Just as Greek tragedy as a form of art can repeat and reject the demonic rule of the pagan gods, the dialectical image as construed by the critical historian repeats and rejects the demonic forces of capitalist consumer culture. Just like the silent gesture with which the tragic hero makes his way out of a world order that has brought about his death, the dialectical image is a silent gesture pointing to the emergency exit, as it were, of the permanent catastrophe named history. The dialectical image thus realizes the revolutionary chance in the fight for an oppressed past. With its explosive and destructive force, the dialectical image provides what Benjamin calls the authority of the frame, a violent rupture that blasts all notions of continuity and ends the realm of myth. With this, let me come to some concluding remarks. As to Warburg, also to Benjamin, antiquity does not pervade timeless images of classic repose. The forms imported from antiquity are rather dynamic forms of motion that can induce change. Just as Warburg alludes to the Laokoan group, group where art has momentarily conquered the entangled state of mythical consciousness, Benjamin interprets Greek tragedy as a step out of the world of demonic ambiguity. The agony of the tragic hero, the pregnante Augenblick, the pregnant moment of Laokoan's death, create a moment of transition in its, in its purest sense. And it is only in this sense that antiquity may attain the power of an example, not as a timeless ideal, but as an energetic movement momentarily arrested. The rest is fashion. No, thank you.